Hi, this is Roy Shoman, and welcome again to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the completion, the fulfillment, the full realization of all of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. We're at, of course, this most holy point in the year, the middle of the Holy Triduum, the day before Easter. And we have, in some sense, just lived through Holy Week and the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper and, of course, the crucifixion and death of our Lord and Savior yesterday on Good Friday. So I thought that what I would do for today's show is I would use a previously recorded talk I gave. Uh, again, it was given during the Triduum a few years ago at a retreat that I was giving. And it is on, it's a looking back at the trial that condemned Jesus to death according to Jewish law. It's a look at the Jewish world at the time of the condemnation of Jesus, the high priesthood, the legal structure, and most specifically, the tremendous, tremendous abusiveness and hypocrisy of the, quote, authorities, close quote, who condemned Jesus to death. Uh, the title of the talk was The Illag Illegality of the Trial uh, Before the Sanhedrin That Condemned Jesus to Death, that, of course, notorious trial that took place between Thursday evening after the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane and Friday morning when the uh, Way of the Cross began. So with that, let me go to that recording. Uh, after that recording, in the spirit of that recording in some sense, I will play the Lamentations of Jeremiah from the Tenebrae service. Uh, that takes place during the Triduum. And the Lamentations of Jeremiah, they're chanted in a very beautiful, mournful chant. They are bemoaning the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place uh, at the time of the Babylonian conquest in the 6th century BC. When Jeremiah wrote them, that's what they were bemoaning. But when they are repeated in the Triduum liturgy, what they are bemoaning is the destruction of the Jewish nation, which was to follow on the crucifixion of our Lord about, about uh, 40 years later, when Jerusalem was destroyed. And the refrain from the Lamentations is, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, be converted to the Lord thy God. And so I am playing this uh, talk about the illegality of the trial that condemned Jesus to death. And I am playing the uh, tenebrae chant of the Lamentations as in part an invitation, an invitation that our hearts go out, of course, to Jesus for what he suffered. And that finally, after a wait so long, the Jewish people who under the misguided leadership of the time uh, were the agent of uh, the death of Jesus, might finally, finally, finally receive the grace to recognize the Messiah that they themselves brought to the whole world. As the Lamentations refrain says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, be converted to the Lord thy God. So with that prayer, let me go into the recorded talk and then the recording of the Lamentations uh, chanted by a very lovely religious community in Chicago called, I believe, the Canons Regular of St. Peter Canisius. Um, so with that, let's just go to the recording, as I said, of the uh, first the talk on the trial that condemned Jesus to death, and then the Lamentations. I hope you enjoy it. I, I want to set the backdrop of kind of the Jewish world at the time, uh, what was going on with the high priesthood and with the Sanhedrin and what the, the legal structure behind Jesus' trial was and so forth. <coughs> so let me just start with, um, with talking about the, uh, the Jewish world in which the Passion took place and in, in which Jesus' condemnation took place. 
Um, first of all, obviously, at the time of Jesus, um, the Jewish state, Israel, was under uh, Roman rule, under Roman occupation, as a colony. Now, Rome wanted peace in its colonies, and one way it achieved that is by allowing as much self-rule as it could afford to in the colonies, let it essentially let the, let the local cultures you know, govern themselves as much as possible and stay out of the way and reserve for the Roman higher authority only those things that it had to preserve to preserve kind of ultimate authority. And those things were, of course, the ability to raise taxes, the military, and the death sentence. So all, everything else, essentially, the, the infrastructure of the Jewish state was allowed to take care of for itself, which meant that the high priest and the Sanhedrin, who are, of course, the bad guys in the Gospels and also in the Passion movie, um, they were the ultimate legal authority in Israel, uh, except that they did not have the ability to, uh, they didn't have a military and they didn't have the ability to impose the death sentence. The uh, right to impose the death sentence was taken away from the Jewish authorities in 11 AD by the Roman authorities. And um, this was a crisis in Judaism because there was a prophecy already in Genesis, right? The Sabbath shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This was a messianic prophecy, and when the ability to impose the death sentence was removed from the Jewish people, they saw that as um, the scepter departing from Judah, and the ruler's staff from before his feet. So it was like a crisis. It's like this wasn't supposed to happen until the Messiah came, and it's happened. And in fact, the uh, members of the Sanhedrin at that point the Sanhedrin was um, the Jewish High Court. It, it composed uh, 70 members. Um, I'll talk in a moment. I'm getting off track, but I'll talk a little bit more about the Sanhedrin. Uh, they covered themselves in sackcloth and ashes in mourning because this was like a failure of the prophecy about the Messiah coming. Well, we know that the Messiah had come. 11 AD was a very good point in time for this to have happened. Um, but, um, but anyway, uh, that was all a little bit of a digression, I guess but relevant. Now, the Sanhedrin composed, was composed of 70 members. The belief in Judaism about the Sanhedrin was that it was the direct descendant of the council of elders that um, God had established for Moses. I don't know how many of you remember the story, but when, when Moses was leading the 12 tribes of Israel through the desert after the Exodus, um, he was pretty fed up with them, always complaining and always giving trouble and always uh, running to him with, with all of their squabbles and contentions. And he said to God, what am I going to do with this you know, rebellious and disobedient and difficult people? How can I handle all of this? And God essentially said, okay, assemble 70 of your elders and I will give them a portion of the spirit that I have given to you and you can let them be judges and rule over the people. Now, obviously, that spirit was essentially the Holy Spirit, that God was, had a very heavy hand on Moses and was leading him very directly. And so when God said he would give a portion of the spirit that he had given to Moses to these 70, that was essentially saying that they would be anointed, in some sense, with the Holy Spirit and, and be given uh, divine inspiration in what they did. And that set, council of 70 from Moses' time in the desert it was kind of seen as the uh, original Sanhedrin, so to speak. And so the Sanhedrin was held in the highest conceivable regard, um, you know, by the Jewish people as, as I don't want to say semi-divine, but, but um, uh, held in the kind of esteem, at least that, that um, you know, like royalty had in, in Europe 300 years ago, 200 years ago. Now, um, it, was the high, it was the highest tribunal. It was only uh, called into session for matters of the greatest support, uh, importance. And those were when the matter involved the whole tribe, all of the Jewish people, when it involved the false prophet, when it involved the high priest, when it involved declaring war, enlarging Jerusalem, or placing towns under excommunication. For everything less than that, they have they have local tribunals. 
Uh, it was so powerful that Herod the Great, um, who was obviously one of the one of the Roman appointed uh, rulers, and again in the in the Passion of the Christ, you know, you see how how powerful and influential he was. He was actually called before the Sanhedrin as a defendant a few years earlier, and he couldn't get out of it. I mean, he was called into the dock before the Sanhedrin um, to be judged on something he had done involving the death of a band of, of robbers. So you can see how, you know, how, how powerful and influential and, and kind of this, this aura of nobility was over them. Um, however, the, um, uh, oh, one, one, last, one last point before I go on to the trial itself. The, um, in the Gospels, the, um, uh, the Sanhedrin is referred to as the Council of High Priests. Now, in a Jewish context, that is a little bit almost of an oxymoron because there should have only been one high priest at any given point in time. And it was supposed to be a position for which the priest was appointed for life. But in fact, the Gospels are, of course, correct. And at the time of Jesus, um, there were, um, I think, a dozen high priests running around. Um, and the reason was that, <laughs> I know this, in the United, I know the context in the United States, but essentially the pensions were so good that they had it being a rotating office. And people would be appointed to a high priest. An influential person would pay bribes to be appointed as high priest for a year, because then for the rest of his life, he had the stature and the authority that came with being a high priest. So in fact, um, Ananias, who was, um, well, Caiaphas was the high priest at the time of the Passion. His father-in-law was Ananus, who had also been a high priest, and five sons of Ananus, as well as his son-in-law, Caiaphas, had all rotated through the high priesthood as a kind of um, illustration of this corruption and graft that had, had taken over the high priesthood. And it had become this, this kind of uh, semi-political office that was handed out for the um, uh, benefit of the, uh, of the perks that came with it, essentially. Now the Talmud. Now the Talmud is the um, is the uh, the main Jewish scriptures are of course what we call the Old Testament, but there's a second set of Jewish canonical scriptures called the Talmud. Um, the Talmud, according to Judaism, is the oral tradition that began with what God told Moses on Mount Sinai and was passed down orally through the generations until finally it was written down somewhere, uh, well, actually between 200 and 600 AD, when the Jewish people lost, um, essentially lost Israel and went into exile um, and were scattered throughout the world. They decided they'd better write down the oral tradition so it wouldn't get lost. But at the time of Jesus, it was still uh, preserved and strictly orally. Now, the Talmud, in general, uh, and by the way, in Judaism, the Talmud has in even higher authority than the Old Testament does. Um, and that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but in fact, it's very parallel to what we have in the Catholic Church. The reason the Talmud has a higher authority than the Old Testament is because the Old Testament can be mysterious and difficult to understand, whereas the Talmud is kind of an explanation of it, and therefore, one is less likely to make a mistake understanding it. And in fact, in a kind of parallel way, although uh, church doctrine can never contradict sacred scripture. If, 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 one, if it appears to contradict sacred scripture, you know you should go with dogma rather than scripture because there's more of a possibility of misunderstanding scripture. In other words, it's not a true contradiction, but this, the safe course is to follow dogma because it is a more accessible interpretation. And the Talmud usually has nothing but the highest of praise for the high priests. But about the, at the time of Jesus, this is what the Talmud said about the high priest. What a plague is the family of Adonis. Okay, that's the family that held the high priesthood at the time of the Passion. Cursed be their hissing of vipers. Their servants strike the peoples with, slave, with staves. Uh, the porch of the sanctuary cried out, Depart from here, descendants of Eli. You, you pollute the temple of the Eternal. So those are the words that the Talmud itself had 
for the high priesthood at the time of the Passion. So let me go into the behavior of the high priesthood and the Sanhedrin um, at the time of the Passion, but let me just pause to take a breath take a, and ask, can everyone hear me? Yes. And am I talking too fast? No. Okay. Um, another danger of being maybe a New Yorker. Um, anyway, um, superficially, when you watch the, the movie of the Passion, one might um, fall for the um, for the impression that Jesus was condemned to death, frankly, right now at the night between his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane and Good Friday. But if you look at the uh, scriptures, it's evident that he had been condemned to death by the Jewish authorities three separate times before then, without a trial. Let me go through those, um, those three times. The first time is made evident um, in, in John chapter 9, if you remember the story of the man born blind that Jesus restored his sight to. And um, um, let me actually see if I can quickly turn to that. Um, because if you remember that story, the Jewish authorities called the man's parents before them and said, you know, what's the story about your son regaining his vision? And they were afraid to answer the Jewish authorities because, quote, the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Do you remember that from the story? Let me, let me actually... Uh, um, Uh, read it. Uh, the Jews, this is uh, John chapter 9, starting at verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Okay. Now, now if the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, that is the Messiah, he should be put out of the synagogue, means that they had already declared an order of excommunication on his followers. And for them to have declared an order of excommunication on his followers, they must have uh, de uh, basically declared him a false prophet. And the penalty for being a false prophet was death. So we know from this passage in, in John 9 that the, um, that the Sanhedrin had essentially already assembled and at least implicitly passed the sentence of death on Jesus. Because they must have officially decided that he was a false prophet if they then officially decided that all of his followers should be excommunicated. The second time, the sec that's clear, right? Mm -hmm. the, the second uh, time that the Sanhedrin must have met to declare a, um, uh, essentially a death sentence on Jesus. Now, now I will, after I go through these, I will go through all of the Jewish laws uh, essentially protecting people against the death sentence because all of these uh, verdicts of essentially death on Jesus were totally illegal by Jewish law. The second time that the Sanhedrin met and essentially declared a death sentence on Jesus in his absence was a few months later. Um, uh, okay, uh, and, and on the occasion, it was about four months later on the occasion of the resurrection of Lazarus. Um, on that occasion, um, the, uh, this, the chief priests in the Sanhedrin gathered. I'll read the passage from John 11. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, you do not understand, that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. So from that day on they took counsel 
how to put him to death. Okay, so they clearly have passed this time explicitly a death sentence on Jesus without a trial, without calling any witnesses, without calling him, giving him an opportunity to defend himself. And this was again totally illegal by Jewish law. Um, and we see that at that point, the uh, the entire the chief priests and the entire council had essentially determined a death sentence on Jesus. Um, this sentence was pronounced without summoning the accused, without any witnesses, without any investigation of his doctrines. It wasn't pronounced because Jesus was a seditious or revolutionary, but simply because it was necessary to put a stop to his miracles and prevent people from following him. And it was ratified from by the whole assembly, right? Because the Gospels say um, from that day on they took counsel of how to put him to death. So it was a settled question. The only question was how and when to do it. So we have plenty of evidence from the Gospels that Jesus' death sentence long preceded his arrest and, and <coughs> a kangaroo trial. That's an expression that he went to kangaroo trial. Um, now the third section that condemned him to death before his arrest was um, just a few days before the Passover. And let me read a, a, some uh, verses from the Gospels. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and took counsel together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be a tumult among the people. Okay, so again, they all gathered together. They had all determined that they were going to arrest and kill him. And the only question was how to do this without causing too much of an uprising among the people. Um, the, um, then, of course, there was the final um, kangaroo trial, which, which we're, we're going to see in a few minutes in the, um, um, in the movie. Now, the, um, let me back up and say a little bit about why I'm saying this. I will now go through a little bit some of the many violations of Jewish law which were entailed in Jesus' condemnation. Um, the count is um, that there were at least 27 serious violations of Jewish law, which was designed essentially to prevent this, um, any one of which violation would have been sufficient to invalidate the death sentence. When one goes through all of the Jewish laws um, violated in Jesus' um, condemnation, um, it's not impossible to have a sense, at least I have the sense, I'm, I'm not saying it's justified, one could almost imagine that that body of Jewish jurisprudence came about to prevent the condemnation of Jesus. In other words, looking back on it, it almost looks like all of, this, all of these rules were designed to prevent exactly what happened. Um, almost as though there was some, you know, obviously divine uh, inspiration behind the laws uh, to prevent this happening. And again, in, in kind of then implicitly, just to draw the lines of black and white uh, really clearly about, about, okay, this is a little bit of a digression, but on the one hand, what we see in the movie of the Passion and what we see in the condemnation of Jesus was a grotesque villainy on the part of the Jews. There's no question about that. Um, when I see it, I see two things at work. One is um, kind of the real Judaism, and the other is this kind of anti-Judaism, which had taken over, this kind of um, diabolical caricature of Judaism that had permeated um, certainly the higher ranks of the Jews. Um, when you see the Passion movie, you see you see all of these Jews, um, I, I, I'm tempted to wish I was most proud of them, but all of these Jews in their ritual garb, right, in their fringe garments, they're called um, talus, you know, and, and their, their um, you know, those prayer shawls and so forth, and the high priest with his special breastplate and everything. And you see them, and you think they're the Jews, and then you see uh, Jesus and the disciples and the Blessed Virgin Mary and Simon the Cyrenian and stuff, and you think those are the good guys. Well, they're both Jews, 
Both of those sets of people are Jews. Everyone you see in the movie is a Jew, whether they're a good guy or they're a bad guy. And you have the kind of good guy Jews in the movie who are the um, disciples and followers of Jesus and the, the women of Jerusalem who weep over him and so forth. And you have the bad guy Jews who are the, you know, the guys in the Sanhedrin condemning him to death and so forth. And um, so I guess I'm trying to paint a picture of this kind of, uh, frankly, real noble-hearted Judaism on the one hand, which was what, when it was operating in the souls of the people, led them to recognize Jesus. And the other, on the other hand, this kind of diabolical caricature of Judaism, which had taken over the higher Jewish infrastructure. So um, when you go through all of these laws, which were designed in some sense to protect Jesus during his trial, I think what you see is, is kind of the, the true Judaism, the noble-hearted spirit behind Judaism, which of course is the spirit behind Christianity, because you know, because um, Judaism was the precursor to Christianity. I'll talk about that, of course, uh, much more. Um, so anyway, let me let me go into that kind of a protection of the accused that was um, meant to be very, very firmly established in Jewish law. I'll go through this uh, uh, relatively quickly because there, as I said, there are 27 violations. Um, First of all, the court was prohibited from meeting to decide capital cases, cases in which the penalty could be death, either on a Sabbath or a feast day, or on the day preceding a Sabbath or a feast day. Obviously, this council was called um, the day before the Passover. Um, the, uh, the trial could not take place at night. Uh, obviously, the trial began at night. Um, the, um, the Talmud says the reason why the trial of a capital offense could not be held at night is because a more thorough and searching examination uh, could be made by daylight. Um, the witnesses in the trial must give their testimony separately in the presence of the accused. Uh, this doctrine comes from the book of Daniel, the story of the trial of Susanna. I don't know how familiar that is to you, but, but it's a very famous case where, actually it's, it's kind of parallel in some sense, because they were Jewish elders who tried, frankly, to, to rape the young woman, and she wouldn't let them. And they said, if you don't let us have our way with you, we'll say um, that, you, that you did let us have your way, our way with you, and you'll be, um, you'll be stoned for adultery. And she still preserved her honor and wouldn't. And then um, they got away with it, and she was being let off to be stoned when this boy came up and said, you know, don't you Jewish elders know anything? Um, let me examine the witnesses, and he insisted that they be examined one by one, separately, out of the presence of the other. And he asked each one separately, what kind of a tree did she give herself to you under? And they disagreed. One said one kind of a tree, and the other said another kind of a tree, and that was proof that uh, they were lying, and then they were actually stoned instead of her, because that was by Jewish law the penalty. If you falsely accuse somebody of a crime, you were subject to the same uh, punishment. So anyway, because of that, the witnesses were to give their testimony separately out of each other's presence, in the presence of the accused, so that one could see whether they, um, whether they agreed or not. Um, before testifying, this also came from the story of Daniel. Before testifying, the witnesses had to solemnly uh, promise to tell the truth. Um, uh, it, it, this is the, the passage from the Talmud. The judge shall address each witness as follows. It is not conjecture or anything you may have heard that we ask of you. If you should cause the accused to be condemned unjustly, his blood shall cry for vengeance against you, and God will hold you accountable. Um, obviously, this was not done. The witnesses were not sworn in. Um, the judges must carefully weigh the testimony of each witness. That was not done. No testimony is valid unless the witnesses all agree in every detail, the line from the Talmud is if one witness contradicts another, his testimony is not accepted. Um, the accused must not be condemned on his own confession, um, which of course, you know, found its way into, um, you know, into our law. Um, the line from the Talmud is, uh, should a man make confession of guilt before a legally constituted tribunal, such confession is not to be used against him. Now, this is very interesting when you read the accounts of the Gospel, because, um, uh, let me actually read the passage from John 18, because, of course, Jesus refused to answer Caiaphas when Caiaphas 
asked him directly, right? Um, uh, here, this is uh, chapter 18, starting with verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me. What I said to them, they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is this how you answer the high priest? Now, what was going on here was Jesus was, was protecting the high priest from sinning. Out of respect for the honor of the high priesthood, Jesus did not want to be a party to his sin. If Jesus had testified against himself, in other words, if he had said in the court what he had been preaching, he would have been allowing the high priest to force him to testify against himself, which would have been a sin on the part of the high priest. He refused to answer, you know, out of, you know, out of, um, out, obviously, out of his nobility and out of his respect for the high priesthood. Um, the, um, he only later answered when, when, the, when Caiaphas said, I order you, you know, in the name of the Most High to answer. Um, and by the way, this is not my, uh, this is not my conjecture. It actually, it comes from St. Cyprian. Um, the, um, I'll read the passage from St. Cyprian. Jesus' refusal to respond to the question and thus give testimony against himself was motivated by his reverence for the office of the high priest. If he, did not, if he did not do it, it was because he was unwilling to dishonor the high priesthood in the person holding that sacred office. Um, the, um, I'll just go through some of the other, um, some of the other um, aspects of Jewish law that were violated in the trial. Uh, the expression of the judge toward the accused must be humane and even kind, treating him with gentleness and respect. Um, the accuser cannot also be the judge. Now you'll see, I mean, we know from the Gospels, and you see very, very uh, uh, dramatically in the movie, that Caiaphas is simultaneously the high judge of the council and the primary accuser of Jesus. Um, the, um, uh, in that, there's a passage in, in Matthew 26, uh, and it's just two, two or three sentences. Uh, and those two or three sentences contain probably about six or seven violations of the Jewish law governing these, these kinds of trials. Um, the, I'll read the passage. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. Blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. The high priest tore his robes. Um, it was against Jewish law, Leviticus uh, chapter 21 uh, says specifically that the high priest is forbidden from rending his clothes. Uh, when Caiaphas says he has uttered blasphemy, uh, that's another irregularity, since as the high priest, he is uh, essentially he's publicly condemning Jesus and not allowing the other judges, therefore, to come to their own determination. The, um, when he says... Um, what is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. Uh, Jewish law had a very specific rule about going through the judges one by one and recording their votes, which had to be either I absolve or I condemn. And, and so this idea of a kind of a, a mass shouting out of a sentence was a direct violation. Uh, when he said, what, you know, what further need do we have of witnesses? That was a violation because all of the witnesses had to be um, called. Um, the, um, and of course, um, uh, the sentence, we see here that the sentence, the death sentence was pronounced the same day as the trial, where it's pronounced at the trial, but the, um, the Talmud requires that if it is a capital crime, the sentence has to be postponed until at least the next day, so that the judges have the ability essentially to sleep on it and to, to um, weigh their decision you know, calmly in the absence overnight before they, um, before they pronounce sentence the next day. Um, the, um, I, I mean, I could actually go on, if 
I, okay, I'll just go on. I mean, there, there are 27 violations. It gets a little dull. Um, and also, the, some of them are, are seem kind of uh, repetitive because, because they are um, in the same spirit of this kind of mob action that, that was the trial when all of that was, um, was forbidden. But I'll mention um, um, oh, I'll mention uh, two others at least. Uh, one is kind of obvious, but um, um, Jesus' offense was essentially claiming to be the Son of God. Uh, no attempt was made to determine whether that was in fact true. In other words, on the face of it, his claim to be the Son of God would only have been blasphemy if it were untrue. So to determine that that claim was blasphemy logically required a determination of whether his claim to be the Messiah might in fact be true. There was obviously never any, any attempt, any consideration of doing that at all. As a matter of fact, in a kind of backhanded way, it's very telling that in the earlier condemnation, you know, in the kind of pre pre-trial condemnation, when Caiaphas uh, said, what shall we do if we don't do something about him, all the Jewish nation shall follow him. Again, there, you know, there was never any consideration of, of um, whether he might be the Messiah. In other words, it wasn't, let's condemn him because he isn't the Messiah. It was, let's condemn him because everyone is, you know, everyone's in danger of following him. It's almost as though let's condemn him because he might be the Messiah. Um, let me um, go into a, a, another digression because it's kind of a favorite of mine, which is the Jews, um, you probably know, um, well, you know from the book of Acts that in the early days of the church, uh, the Jews still went to the synagogue, they still went to do the temple worship, um, and they also celebrated the Lord's Day on Sunday, and it only became clear over time that Jewish Christians were no longer um, no longer participated as Jews in Jewish worship. Now, the final severance between the Jewish, the Jewish Christian community and the non-Christian Jewish community only came about 130 AD um, uh, in what became the second major Jewish revolt against the Roman authorities. Um, and it was at that point that the Jewish uh, Christians were formally banned from the temple and actually put under a curse. Um, now the cause for that was that when the Jews uh, tried to rebel against the Roman authorities around 130 AD, they were following a man called Bar Kokhba who claimed to be the Messiah. And as the Messiah, who was leading a military revolt against the Roman authorities. Now all of the Jews uh, uh, threw themselves into this revolt except the Christian Jews who couldn't do so because to do so would be to follow a false messiah. They could hardly acknowledge that Bar Kokhba was the messiah since Jesus was the messiah. So they could hardly follow him in this revolt. And it was in um, the, the, the Jewish authorities' anger at these Jewish Christians for not joining the revolt that the Jewish Christians were formally anathemas, anathemized, anathemized and, um, and thrown out of the temple and put under a curse. So, and of course, later, even the Jewish authorities acknowledged that Bar Kokhba had not been the Messiah. So, the Jewish Christians were not excommunicated for following the false Messiah. They were excommunicated for not following the false Messiah. And in fact, they were excommunicated for not following the false Messiah that the Jewish authorities even later acknowledged was a false Messiah. So anyway, a little bit of a digression, but you see in Caiaphas' condemnation of Jesus, that um, he actually did not, he did not address at all the issue of whether he might or might not be the Messiah. And that initial condemnation almost sounds like he was condemning him precisely because he might, might be the Messiah. The final um, violation that I, I want to um, talk about right now is that um, by Jewish law, a sentence of death could only be passed when the Sanhedrin met in a very specific room. It was called the Hall of Hewn Stones, and it was part of the temple. And of course, the trial that condemned Jesus was held in Caiaphas' palace. And so, um, by definition, you know, no, no sentence of death had any validity. 
Um, I've gone through this now um, to give a little to give a little flavor and to give a little backdrop. Um, I know that there's been a lot of you know kind of dense information that I threw out, and I didn't really throw it out for the sake of this dense information as much as for painting the picture. Um, but if you're interested in the dense information, let me just give a little digression, which is which is I wrote an article on all of this that's up on my website, um, salvationisfromthejews.com. So if anybody at any point wanted to download and print out um, you know, an article and have all of these specifics and the sites from the Talmud and everything that's all in there. And um, I think that's um, I think that's probably I'm, I'm, I'm I you know I, I we have a couple minutes maybe I'll you know see if there's any question that I should respond to. Right. Um, there are so many violations. Have you ever questioned the the gospel? Um, the gospels. Uh, well, I haven't. First of all, I, I haven't questioned the gospel because, first of all, because I'm a good Catholic, <laughs> and um, I, I believe in their, you know, historical um, uh, correctness. And also, it's precisely, um, for instance, for instance, um, the issue of there being many high priests. A, 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 I don't want to say a Jewish Jew, but a, a kind of a non-converted Jew, a typical, you know, uh, very cynical towards Christianity Jew, will look at the Gospels and say, you see, the people who wrote these Gospels didn't know anything. They talked about all these high priests running around, whereas everyone knows that the high priesthood was an appointment for life, and there would have been only one high priest at any point in time. Um, but in fact, it turns out the Gospels are correct. And um, if you look at, you know, if you look carefully at the history, um, you find out that although that was the rule, it was being violated in those days. So the gospel accounts are more accurate historically than the, um, you know, kind of naive, you know, we're the expert, we're the Jews, this can't have happened kind of view of things. Um, and I think you see that kind of, you know, you kind of see that over and over again. Um, even that passage in the Talmud about how terrible Ananas, you know, and his sons as high priests were, and how corrupt his family was as high priests. So I think the Gospels actually, um, the closer you look at them, the more evidence you see for their historical accuracy. The other thing is, remember the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Matthew, was in circulation uh, um, probably in the 70s. Um, I know that there's a lot of scripture scholarship about this and so forth, but I'm, I'm a firm believer that the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. I think there's very strong uh, evidence for that, or Aramaic in any case, and um, was was you know written by I think in by the late 60s. So it couldn't have been a very false historical picture because everyone was alive then. I mean, it wouldn't be like a false historical picture of the first man's landing on the moon or whatever, you know. If, you know, somebody came along and told us that, you know, it was Russians who first landed on the moon, we'd hardly believe them because we were around then. So, no, the answer is no, I, I, I don't. Well, I, uh, oh. well, why did they feed souls? Why did conscience feed souls threatened by Jesus? And yet they were willing to follow the other false prophet, the so-called false messiah that came along. Why was he so threatened by Jesus? You mentioned there the first, that he was already, they already had planned uh, twice or three times before it actually happened. Yeah. Why was he so threatened by him? I think there's at least two answers to that. One is um, he was so threatened by him precisely because he was the real Messiah. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there was no stopping him, um, or no stopping him short of killing him. But you know, the real reason is, is, is because uh, everything that happens has an underlayer of spiritual warfare. And in some sense, everything, you know, you have the, the, the devil inspiring, I mean, you have both the devil and the Holy Spirit, in some sense, trying to inspire everybody at every point in time, in some sense. But as people yield themselves more and more to depravity or more and more to sin, they get more and more directly inspired by the fallen spiritual forces, essentially by the demonic forces. And as people uh, purify themselves and, and, and try to live you know, more, more and more in a state of grace, they get more and more inspired by the Holy Spirit. And obviously, um, Caiaphas, um, well, I mean, I'm not saying he was possessed in a, in a, in a 
technical sense, but obviously he had very little resistance to diabolical inspiration. Yeah. And that's another really beautiful thing you see in the Passion movie, mm -hmm. is, is you really see, I mean, they're, they're like the faces of the devil, these mm -hmm. enraged mm -hmm. high priests. And you even see the devil in the person of that like, androgynous, mm -hmm. you know, you know, man, woman walking around, explicitly inspiring people. And um, and Mel Gibson's primary source for the movie, I mean, other than the Gospels, was the visions of Anne Catherine Emmerich, who's um, now uh, beatified. Uh, she was a um, stigmatist mystic nun in Germany in, in the late 19th century, middle 19th century, actually. And, um, and she has beautiful descriptions of demons jumping into these people, and how when when she was watching like the condemnation trial, she was she had a, she was an eye according to her vision, she was a eye, you know an eyewitness. She saw all these little demons, you know, like jumping into them and spilling out of their mouths and standing on their shoulders in these horrible forms of you know uh, distorted frogs and lizards and all these horrible things. And uh, I don't think there's any question that that um, this the what you see in the movie, that, that was it. I mean, that, that was really essentially um, pretty full war diabolical inspiration. I hope you enjoyed that recorded talk on the state of the Jewish world at the time that Jesus was condemned by the Jewish authorities, and most particularly on the illegality, the manifold illegalities of the trial that condemned him to death that even suggest that God tried to build into Jewish law protection after protection after protection to avoid the horrendous mistake which they did in fact make in condemning Jesus to death. We all know that the Easter liturgy begins with uh, the chant which includes O Happy Fault, it's chanted with respect to the fault of Adam, the fall of Adam, but perhaps we can look at this most horrible event in the history of the Jewish people, their condemnation of Jesus to death, as from our perspective, and perhaps even from the perspective of salvation history, that it too might be seen as a happy fault. Because after all, it was the happy fault that brought about our redemption through Jesus's sacrifice. However, from the point of view of the Jewish people, it of course was a horrible, horrible, horrible fault because among other things, it deprived them of the Messiah that they brought to the rest of the world, the Savior that they brought to the rest of the world, the fulfillment of everything they longed for and hoped for and prayed for for 2,000 years, and it's still keeping them from the fullness of the gift that God try to send them through the Messiah. So in that light, I want to play, as I said at the beginning of the show, the Lamentations of Jeremiah, which are lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem. Jeremiah wrote them lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians about the 6th century BC, but they are chanted in the Triduum Liturgy, bemoaning the destruction of Jerusalem, which followed upon the Jews' condemnation of Jesus and his death about 40 years later when Jerusalem was totally destroyed, um, which has always been seen within Christianity as, in some sense, a consequence of the Jews' rejection of Jesus and of his crucifixion. And the Lamentations refrain is, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, be converted to the Lord thy God. So I am playing it in the hopes that we might be inspired to incorporate that in our prayer in this most holy, somber triduum liturgy that the Jews, through whom Jesus came to the rest of the world, might finally receive the grace to welcome him with open arms, to receive him as their Messiah. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, be converted to the Lord thy God, so that they too may come to Jesus, enter the church, and finally, after so long, the church composed of Jew and Gentile will be ready for the second coming. Here begins the lamentation. 
of Jeremiah the prophet. Hallelujah. Oh, how alone is become the one time popular city. A widow is she who had been mistress of the nations. Into slavery has fallen the princes of kingdoms. Unceasingly she weeps by night, and with tears her cheeks are laden. Among her suitors there is none to console her. Her seeming friends have rejected her, and are become her enemies. Her assailants are oppressing her, and her enemies are prospering. For the Lord has spoken against her, because of the multitude of her iniquities. Her children are led into captivity before the face of her oppressors. Jerusalem, Departed from the daughter of Sion. Her nobles are become like rams that find no pasture. Without strength, therefore, they walk before their pursuers. Jerusalem has sinned most grievously, therefore is she become so repelling. All they that honored her now despise her in her nakedness, beholding her own self in her misery. She sighs and turns backward. Defilement adheres to her garments, and she thought not of the outcome. And now that she is prostrate, there is none to console her. O Lord, behold my misery, for the enemy has become defiant. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, become Stay here and watch with me. 
Now you shall see the crowd that will surround me. You shall take flight, but I shall go to be offered up for you. Behold, the time draws nigh, and the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of sinners. You shall take flight, but I shall go to be offered up for you.